أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم If you recall, we've been discussing the Battle of Tabuk, which was one of the most important battles, and it was actually the last battle that the Holy Prophet led before his demise. And it's an important battle because it reveals the true nature of some of the companions of the Holy Prophet. Many of them were unwilling to participate in this battle. We spoke about the different excuses that were being put forward. Some wanted the Holy Prophet to excuse them and they offered financial support. Others offered horses to the other Muslims to fight in the battlefield. So the verses that we're covering speak about the problem of nifaq in the Muslim community. Now, we've reached ayah number 61, and I want you, again, as we go through these verses, to keep in mind that these are some of the companions of the Prophet less than two years before the Prophet's death. So you see that the problem of nifaq continues up until the Prophet's demise, even in his last years. Now the Battle of Tabuk was the, la the last battle that the Holy Prophet led, but interestingly it's also the only battle that Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, does not participate in. And the reason why the Holy Prophet leaves him behind is because he notices that many of the Munafiqeen are choosing to stay behind. So the Prophet fears that there, is, there, would, there might be a mutiny developing. So he leaves Amir al-Mu'mineen behind and he ventures out to, uh, to Tabu. Now continuing this discussion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about some of the things that the munafiqeen are doing to the Prophet. In ayah number 61, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِيِّ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ أُذُنْ قُلْ أُذُنُ خَيْرٍ, أذن خير لَكُمْ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَيُؤْمِنُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and among them, are those who hurt the Prophet and say he is an ear. He believes in God and he has faith in the believers and he is a mercy to those among you who believe. And as for those who hurt the Messenger of God, for them shall be a painful punishment. The commentators of the Holy Quran, they mention the occasion of the revelation of this ayah. They say that there were a group of munafiqeen who were mocking and insulting the Prophet in a private gathering. And one of the munafiqeen among them said that don't speak ill of the Prophet. What if he finds out that we were bad-mouthing him? What if he finds out that we were mocking him? The munafiqeen, when they heard this, when they heard that there was, well, amongst them, there were those who were concerned that word would get back to the Prophet, they said, don't worry. Even if the Prophet finds out that we were mocking him, we'll simply deny it. If he confronts us, we'll deny it. And he will believe us because he's naive. He listens to every, everyone. When they call him an ear, because that, that's essentially how they're insulting him and mocking him, when the munafiqeen say, huwa udhun, he is an ear, they're essentially saying that the Prophet is naive. We can easily fool him. If he asks us, if he confronts us about our behavior, we'll simply deny it. And because he's a simpleton, because he's naive, he'll listen, he'll believe us. Now it's important to note, brothers and sisters, that you know a personal reflection that I that I walk away with when I look at this verse is that 
even the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, you have to understand that anyone in a leadership position, whether you are an effective leader or you're incompetent, even if you are infallible, you will never be immune to criticism. You know, sometimes when we're in leadership positions, we become very discouraged. We take it very personally when we hear criticism. But even the Holy Prophet ﷺ, who is the perfect leader, he was not immune to criticism. So when you're in a position of power, you always, you always have to remember that it is impossible to please everyone. Even someone like the Prophet, who is perfect, who is infallible, is going to have people among his followers who criticize him, who are unhappy with his leadership. It's interesting that the munafiqeen, they say, they criticize one aspect of his personality, one quality that he has, and that he's a listener. You know, you know these munafiqeen, they have this impression that to be a good ruler, to be a real leader means that you have to be a dictator. The Holy Prophet ﷺ was consultative. He listened to everyone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, when they mock the Prophet saying that he is an ear, and in the Arabic language, calling someone an ear means that you're referring to their listening skills, that they're listeners. In the same way, in the Arabic language, if, if you want to refer to a spy, you say that, you know, they would call him an eye. So this is, you know, uh, a common usage in the Arabic language. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to them. He says, say, that the Prophet is an ear that is good for you. Allah is saying that it's good that he listens to you that he doesn't accuse you that even when you when he can, when you're confronted about your behavior and you lie the prophet overlooks your faults the fact that he listens is something that's actually good for you he makes you feel that you're a part of the community he makes you feel that you're involved that you're a participant but then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispels this accusation that the prophet is naive when allah says yu'minu billah he listens to everyone this was the nature of the prophet that he would listen to all people believers and even the hypocrites he would listen to them he would give them time he would give them a private audience but allah says he he believes in god meaning he will listen to everyone but his heart is always connected to Allah and he will only do what is pleasing to Allah. He is willing to hear everyone's perspective. He's willing to listen to everyone's point of view. The Prophet is consultative. He's humble. But Allah says, Yu'minu billah. Don't think that just because he listens to you, he's going to follow you. His heart is connected to God. And he has faith, he believes the believers. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ, even though he listens to everyone, he knows who to believe. You know, if someone, if a munafiq comes to him and, and says something to him, the Prophet will listen, He'll, he won't shun him. But the Prophet is not going to believe that person. If someone like Abu Dhar and Ammar ibn Yasir come to the Prophet, the Prophet has faith in them. So the Prophet is not naive. Don't think that because he's consultative and he listens that he's naive. His heart is connected to God. And he believes and he trusts the mu'mineen. He is a mercy to those among you who believe. Now you may ask, the question here that arises is that, doesn't the Holy Quran tell us that the Prophet is rahmatan lil'alameen? We, we all, we're all familiar 
with the famous verse of the Holy Quran where Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we have not sent you but as a mercy to the world. But in this ayah, in ayah number 61 of Surah at tawbah Allah says, وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ He is a mercy to those who believe among you. So how do we reconcile this? We reconcile this because, it's and it's very simple to reconcile these, these verses. In the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar Rahman. Allah's mercy, Allah's Rahmaniya reaches everyone. As we read in the first line of Dua Kumail, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasa'at kulla shay. There is a type of mercy that encompasses everything when we're speaking about God. Similarly, the Rahma of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, a part of his rahma extends to all things. But there is a special type of mercy that only the believers enjoy. And that is what? The mercy of his guidance. Those who believe in him and they follow him, they earn guidance. And the best and the ultimate form of mercy is guidance. So there are two levels of the Prophet's mercy. There is the universal mercy, and there is the special mercy that is afforded to the mu'mineen. The universal mercy of the Prophet is, for example, alluded to in, in Surah Al-Anfal, verse, verse 32, where Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِ Ya Rasulullah, we would not punish them as long as you are among them. So the Prophet is a rahma to even the kuffar because past civilizations, Allah used to send down his punishment and eradicate entire nations. But this type of divine wrath was suspended in honor of the Holy Prophet. As long as Rasulullah is among them, Allah will not completely wipe out the kuffar and the mushrikeen. So his mere presence is a safety net for the inhabitants of the earth. So this is that universal rahmah. So on the one hand, there is a level of prophetic mercy that encompasses al-alameen, the worlds. But Allah in this verse is speaking out is speaking about that specific mercy, that special mercy in the form of guidance that those who listen to the Prophet, those who obey him, they will enjoy the special rahma, which is hidayah, which is guidance. And then the verse ends with a very powerful statement. A threat from Allah Azza wa Jal. You see, brothers and sisters, you know, the Prophet also felt pain. You know, sometimes we forget that Masumin are also human beings. Yes, spiritually, they are beyond anything that we can even imagine. His spiritual essence is incomprehensible to us. But the Prophet has human emotions. When the ayah says, وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِي And from among them are those who hurt the Prophet. Meaning the Prophet used to actually be distressed. He used to feel that emotional pain. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a warning at the end of this ayah. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Those who hurt the Prophet, for them shall be a painful punishment. Now, the Prophet ﷺ experienced pain on two main levels. He experienced physical pain. So there are those who physically hurt the Prophet. They assaulted him. They inflicted physical pain on him. So this is one way in which the Prophet was hurt. This is one way to hurt the Prophet, to physically 
abuse him. And the Prophet endured physical abuse. He endured physical pain. But there's also another type of pain, another way that someone can hurt the Prophet. And that is through your words, through your actions, that you can cause emotional distress on the Prophet. So there may, there may be a companion who doesn't lay their fingers on the Prophet. God forbid they don't physically injure the Prophet. But they do and they say things that are hurtful to the Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah Al-Hujurat is Surah number 49 of the Holy Quran. If you look at the first two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers. So you find that in, in the first two verses of Surah Al-Hujurat, you find that it was not only the mushrikeen and the kuffar who were hurting the Prophet and who were exhibiting coarse manners with the Prophet, even among those who claim to be Muslims. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allahi wa rasulih. O you who believe, do not advance before God and His Messenger. You know, our, our Sunni brothers and sisters who believe that Abu Bakr is the rightful successor of the Prophet, one of the evidences that they put forward is that Abu Bakr led Salah during the lifetime of the Prophet, that Rasulullah was ill and the Prophet joined the prayer and Rasulullah prayed behind Abu Bakr. This is allegedly a proof that Abu Bakr is the rightful successor. If you say that he led the Prophet in prayer, he went against ayah number one from Surah Al-Hujurat, which clearly says, do not go ahead of Allah and his Prophet. That that this is the type of adab that has to be displayed in the presence of the Prophet. That you shouldn't walk in front of him. You should never dare to pray in front of him. You should never put forward an opinion that is contrary to his, that contradicts his opinion. And then you go to the second verse. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. You know, subhanAllah, it's as though the first ayah was revealed in relation to Abu Bakr, and the second ayah was revealed in relation to Umar ibn al-Khattab, as in the famous incident of the calamity of Thursday when the Prophet was prevented from writing his wasiya, Umar ibn al-Khattab prevents the Prophet from writing his wasiyah and says inna, inna that the man is hallucinating. Not only does he raise his voice in the presence of the Prophet, he insults the Prophet. Now pay attention to this ayah. Allah says, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. So we're not even talking about an insult. If you simply raise your voice in the presence of the Prophet, don't talk to the Prophet the way that you talk to each other. There needs to be a certain etiquette that has to be observed when you interact with the Prophet. Now, what's the consequence? If you disrespect the Prophet in something as simple as raising your voice, Allah says, أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Look at the, the etiquette, the adab, the mannerism that is required when you interact with the Prophet. If you raise your voice in the presence of Rasulullah, what happens? The consequence is all of your past deeds are nullified. Imagine someone was praying Salatul Layl for 20 years, and in the presence of Rasulullah, they raise their voice. 
All of that ibadah is canceled, null and void. That's if you just raise your voice. That's not raising your voice and saying something insulting. So this is another way to hurt the Prophet, to be disrespectful in his presence. And sometimes someone can hurt the Prophet by hurting those who are very dear to him. So sometimes someone may hurt the Prophet directly, either through a physical injury or through emotional distress. And sometimes you can hurt the Prophet indirectly by abusing those who he considers very dear to him. Those who he considers to be a part of him. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Fatima bagatum minni. When the Prophet says, Fatima is a part of me. Man adaha faqad adani. Whoever hurts her hurts me. So when we read ayah number 61 from Surah At Tawbah, where Allah says, Walladina yu'duna Rasulullah lahum adabun alim. Those who hurt the Messenger of God for them is a painful punishment. We can extend the meaning of this verse to those who hurt Fatima to Zahra. Because those who hurt Fatima hurt the Messenger. And you have to go and read Islamic history. Who hurt Fatima? And once you identify who hurt the daughter of the Prophet, the Quran is very clear that for them is a painful punishment. Those who hurt Ali ibn Abi Talib, those who hurt Imam al Hassan, who did not allow Imam al Hassan to be buried beside his grandfather, don't you think this would hurt the Prophet to prevent his grandson from being buried beside him? Those who hurt Imam al Hussein, those who oppressed the family of the Prophet, they are all included in this phrase. So it's important for us to identify those who hurt those who are dear to the Prophet so we don't align ourselves with those who hurt the Messenger by hurting his Ahlul Bayt. In the next ayah, ayah number 62, Allah says, يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ لَكُمْ Allah says they swear by God to you. To you meaning the believers. They swear to God. They swear by God to you to please you. But God and his messenger are worthier of being pleased by them if they are believers. Now, the Holy Prophet so these are the munafiqeen who used to swear, who used to take oaths, expressing their solidarity with the Muslim community. And the Holy Prophet trained the mu'mineen not to be cynical, that if a fellow believer tells you something, believe them. Do not be skeptical of them. Don't Get, don't doubt them. Give them the benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, this ayah is also teaching the believers that they shouldn't be naive. The munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they wish to show their solidarity with the Muslim community by swearing that we are with you. By offering money to the Muslims, but not joining them in the battlefield by offering horses to them, but not actually supporting them on the ground. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here reminds the mu'mineen that don't be fooled. If their solidarity was sincere, they should be more concerned with pleasing God and His Messenger as opposed to just appeasing the community of the believers. If they are truly sincere, 
that they should strive to please God and his messenger. They should come and join the Prophet in Tabuk. Now in this ayah, brothers and sisters, there is a very practical lesson for us, that if we ever want to gauge anyone's commitment to Islam, and if we want to gauge our own commitment to Islam, we don't, we don't gauge it by our claims, nor our feelings. You know, you can claim many things. You know, every Muharram, we claim that we wish we were with Imam al Hussein. When we hear the name of the 12th Imam, we claim that we are prepared for him, that we are anxiously awaiting his return. But in this ayah, Allah is reminding us that true conviction, true commitment to the Islamic cause is not just by talking. It's not just by making oaths. It's not just by expressing your feelings. You know, sometimes, you know, you meet people. I've met many individuals. For example, they don't pray. They don't do their salah. But they say, they claim to love God. They say, I feel so connected to God with my heart. But they don't, they don't pray. They don't do their salah. They say, I love God. But you don't see that love manifested in their life. If you love God, why are you finding it so difficult to pray to Him? If you truly love God, why are you finding it so difficult to perform your salah? There should be signs of your love. The munafiqeen claim to love God. They claim to love the messenger. But where is that love being reflected in your actions? If you love Rasulullah, you should go with him to Tabuk and ensure that he's protected and to ensure that he has enough supporters. So we don't gauge our commitment to the Islamic cause by our feelings and our claims. We gauge it by what? Our actions. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 63, Alam Alim. Do they not know that whoever opposes God and his messenger, surely for, for him shall be the fire of hell eternally? That is the great disgrace. Now, the word yuhadid comes from the word muhadda or hadda. You know, in the Arabic language, we have this, the word hudud. Hudud are the boundaries. Had, it means the boundary of something or the edge of something or the end of something. And therefore, the Arabs, when they would speak about their enemies, because the enemy is standing on the other side, on the edge of the other side, this would be called muhad. So the word yuhad, it means to have enmity, to oppose. Now, you may ask, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using such a harsh tone with these munafiqeen? You know, someone may argue that at least, you know, they're offering money. At least they're offering horses to the Prophet. You know, they're, they're playing the neutral card. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using such a harsh tone with them? That he's threatening them so severely. The reason is, brothers and sisters, some of the mufassireen, they say that there were among, among the companions of the Prophet, there were those who used to try to draw a distinction between God's orders and the Prophet's orders. So for example, when the Prophet ﷺ was commanding the Muslims to join him in Tabuk, some of the companions thought that, is this from you, O Muhammad, or is this from God? You know, because some of the Prophet's commands are not mentioned in the Qur'an. 
So there was this idea. Now we as Muslims today, we know that whatever the Prophet says is divinely inspired. But during the Prophet's life, some of the companions were reluctant to obey the Prophet if he was asking them to do something, if he was commanding them to do something that was not explicitly mentioned in the Quran. They would ask, is this from you or is this from God? Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear that there is no difference in opposing the Prophet and opposing God. So Allah says, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُ مَنْ يُحَادِدِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَأَنَّ لَهُ نَارَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدًا فِيهَا Do they not know that whoever opposes God and his messenger, meaning opposing the messenger, is tantamount to opposing God Himself. Their commands are the same. For them is the punishment of hell for all of eternity, and that is the great disgrace. Now, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention that this is al-khizyul azim? You know, sometimes Allah, when He speaks about the punishment of hell, He says it's a painful punishment. Sometimes He says that it's a disgraceful punishment. Why does Allah use different adjectives? When Allah speaks about painful punishment, the mufassirin, they say that it's referring to the physical aspect of the torment. But here, al khizyul al-Azim is referring to the psychological punishment of the hellfire. Now you have to understand that from the perspective of the munafiqeen, they're actually trying to save face. And notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't really expose them. He doesn't mention specific names. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately also wants to guide these munafiqeen. The munafiqeen, they refuse to join the Prophet in Tabuk, but they offer money, they offer horses. Why do they do that? Because they want to protect their reputation. They don't want to be humiliated in the community. They're pretending to support the Prophet because they're afraid of what? They're afraid of being disgraced. They're afraid of humiliation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them that if you don't if you oppose the prophet if you don't obey him and you don't support him you will face your greatest fear in the hereafter which is disgrace and humiliation you're worried about not being disgraced in dunya you should be more concerned about what's going to happen to you in the akhirah you will be humiliated and you will be disgraced so save yourself from that eternal humiliation by joining the Prophet, by obeying him. Ayah number 64, يَحْذَرُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ أَن تُنَزَّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُورَةٌ تُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ قُلُوا اسْتَهْزِئُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْرِجٌ مَا تَحْذَرُونَ Allah says in ayah number 64, the hypocrites dread that a surah be sent down against them of that which is in their hearts. Say, go on mocking. Truly God will bring forth what you dread. It's interesting, brothers and sisters, that when the Quran was being revealed over the course of 23 years, the Mu'mineen were anxious. They were eager for revelation. They were eager for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reveal something to them that would comfort them, that would guide them, that would console them. But the Munafiqeen were always in a state of paranoia. For 23 years, because there were Munafiqeen even in Mecca, whenever Jibra'il would descend upon the Prophet whenever new verses and new chapters in the Quran of the Quran would be revealed. 
the munafiqeen, their first question would be, was there anything revealed about me? Is this verse referring to me? They were constantly living in fear that the Quran would expose them. Now you may ask, why were they afraid if they didn't even believe that the Quran was the word of God? Now from among the munafiqeen, there are some who may have had a certain degree of iman. And there are others who were outright kuffar disguised as believers. Now those who were kuffar disguised as believers, they may have believed that the Prophet had an ability to know their secrets. They may have considered the Prophet to be a magician in the same way that the kuffar used to call the Prophet Sahir, some of the munafiqeen, they had previous experience with the Prophet knowing their secrets, so they were afraid that this would happen again. So they were always afraid that the Quran would be revealed, exposing them. And on one occasion, especially on the Prophet's way back from Tabuk. I, I think maybe I've mentioned this, that there was an assassination attempt on the Prophet on his way back from Tabuk. So the, the battle never took place. The Muslim army is returning. It's a massive army of 30,000. The Prophet is returning. And on their way back to Medina, they had to cross a very dangerous area, a mountainous area. And, you know, the Prophet was riding on his camel, and because the pathway was so narrow, if the camel lost its footing, the Prophet would fall off of the cliff. And this is even mentioned in either, I believe, Bukhari or Muslim, where some of the Munafiqeen disguised themselves and they tried to frighten the Prophet's camel to make the camel lose its footing and throw the Holy Prophet off of the cliff. And this is when you see Ammar ibn Yasir and Hudayfa attacking the, uh, the Munafiqeen and their faces were covered and they, they ran away. After that, there was a lot of fear that the Quran would actually start to reveal the identities of those who tried to assassinate the Prophet. So again, this ayah is referring to that paranoia. So imagine, brothers and sisters, there are those who many of us, many of, many of the Muslims consider the Ashab of the Prophet, who tried to assassinate the Prophet, who are always living in fear, they're constantly paranoid that the Qur'an is going to reveal something that exposes them. And then in ayah number 65, and actually before we go on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a promise. Allah says first, قُلْ اسْتَهْزِيُ They're always mocking the Prophet. And some of those who tried to assassinate the Prophet, they would, when they would go back to their private gatherings, they would mock and they would make fun of the Prophet. They would laugh over the fact that they almost killed him on his way back from Tabuk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul Go on mocking. Inna Allaha ma tahdarun. God will expose that he will bring forth what you dread. There is a principle, there is a divine sunnah brothers and sisters, that if you do something for the sake of God, even if you do it in secret, Allah one day, if it's good for you, He'll make it known. And if you conspire against the Prophet, and if you do evil, eventually it will come out. The good that you do eventually will come out. And the evil that you do eventually will come out. So this is a divine promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose these munafiqeen. And I would argue, brothers and sisters, that 
one of the ways in which Allah Azza wa Jal exposed them is through Fatima to Zahra. It's through the events that happen after the death of the Prophet by seeing who aligns himself with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because even you know the companions, some of the companions of the Prophet, I believe Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, he says that we used to distinguish between the mu'min and the munafiq after the death of the Prophet by their love or their hatred of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This was the litmus test for us. After the death of the Prophet, if we wanted to know who is Mu'min and who is Munafiq, we see how they feel towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose them. He has a way of bringing this out. So you have these individuals who have so much malice and animosity towards the Prophet and they ridicule the Prophet. They mock him. They mock him in private. Ayah number 65. And if you ask them, they will surely say, We are only engaging in vain talk and playing. Say, Is it God, His signs, and His messenger you are mocking? So these hypocrites mock the Prophet in private. They ridicule him. They make fun of him. When they are confronted, when they're asked, are you mocking the Prophet? When they're caught red-handed, as we say, when these munafiqeen are caught red-handed, mocking and insulting and ridiculing the Prophet, what do they say? What's their defense? We were just kidding around. We were just messing around. Now, Islam has no problem with joking, but there are certain things that you don't joke about. And though there are certain red lines. There's no, there's no problem in laughing and joking around, but there are certain things that are sacred that you should never mock, that you should never joke about. And that is God and His Messenger and His Ayat. And that's why, brothers and sisters, a practical implication, a practical application of this ayah is pop culture today. You know, many of us, we watch movies, we watch TV shows, we watch certain TV programs that openly mock and ridicule prophets and messengers and make fun of religion. They make fun of God. And you guys know these movies and these shows. And sometimes when you, you have Muslims watching these programs and you ask them, why do you watch these things? They're insulting God. They're insulting the prophets. They're insulting Jesus. They're insulting Musa. What do they say? Some Muslims. Oh, it's just a movie. Oh, it's just a comedy. It's just a TV show. There are certain things that we as Muslims, we consider red lines. That's not... That's not a legitimate excuse to say it's just a movie or it's just a cartoon or it's just a TV show. We have to, in the same way that you, you wouldn't want someone to mock your mother or your father, it's okay that someone mocks God. It's some okay that someone ridicules Rasulullah. We have to have a firm stand against these issues. We as Muslims should not support TV shows or movies that explicitly ridicule divine values and ridicule prophets and imams so we have to be very careful because allah in the holy quran he says do you are you mocking are you participating in the mocking and the ridicule of god and his signs and his messenger there are certain things that we as muslims we don't joke about joke about anything else but the quran allah the messengers these things are sacred and we should be offended when our religious values are mocked. You know, instead of buying movie tickets and going and watching these types of movies, these, should, these types of films, these types of programs should be boycotted. And we should not expose our children to these types of programs. Ayah number 66, لا تعتذروا قد كفرتم بعد إيمانكم. 
إن نعف عن طائفة منكم نعذب طائفة بأنهم كانوا مجرمين. Now after these munafiqeen are caught red-handed, some they say that they're joking, but then they what? They try to apologize. They try to make an apology. Allah says, make no excuses. You disbelieved after having believed. You know, some of these munafiqeen, initially they had iman, but they started to associate with other munafiqeen. And this is why, brothers and sisters, we have to pay attention to who we associate with. Some of these people were mu'mineen, but because they were brushing shoulders with other munafiqeen, their faith started to diminish. Don't say that, oh, I, I'm, it's okay, I, I'm a religious person, but I, you know, I'm not going to be affected by my friend or my colleague or my, you know, this acquaintance. You have to pay attention to who you associate with. They will have an effect on your iman. Allah says, make no excuses. You, you disbelieved after having believed. If we pardon a group of you, we shall punish another group for having been guilty. So Allah says, so these munafiqeen, they, they apologize. Allah accepts the apology of some of them, but he will punish others. Some of the munafiqeen, some of them were truly sincere in their apology. You know, maybe some of these individuals, they were passively listening to those who were mocking the Prophet, and they didn't object, and they, they repented. They were remorseful. They reoriented their lives. And Allah accepts their tawbah. Allah is forgiving. He's so merciful. But you have to be sincere. You have to be remorseful. But there are others who are apologizing. They continue ridiculing the Prophet. That their apology was just to regain their social capital. It was not a sincere repentance. Allah says, he will pardon some of you, but he will punish others. So when you seek forgiveness, this ayah teaches us is that first you have to realize that, that you were in the wrong, that you, you have to reorient your life. You have to make real changes if you want Allah Azza wa Jal to pardon you. And then in ayah number 67, and we'll conclude here, Al-Munafiquna wal-Munafiqat بَعْضُهُمْ مِنْ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمُنْكَرِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلِ الْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَقْبِضُونَ أَيْدِيَهُمْ نَسُوا اللَّهَا فَنَسِيَهُمْ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Allah says, the hypocrites, men and women are alike, enjoining evil and forbidding good, clutching their hands shut, they forgot God, and so he forgot them. Indeed, the hypocrites are corrupt. This verse, brothers and sisters, is a reminder that hypocrisy is not gender-specific. There were hypocrites among the companions of the Prophet who were female. You know, usually when we think of munafiqeen, we automatically think of males, the male companions. There are female companions of the Prophet who are munafiqat. You know, say, saying to their husbands or their sons, don't go with the Prophet. Don't support him. Give him money instead. So nifaq is not gender specific. In al-munafiquna wal-munafiqat ba'duhum min ba'd. They are the same. Meaning that they're not like the believers. They're different. They're a different class. You know, there was a woman who was living in Medina. And this shows you the contrast between those who believe and those who are hypocrites. There was a woman, a female companion of the Prophet, who lost her husband, presumably in one of the battles. And she had a son. She had children. And she was having financial difficulties. So her son says to her that why don't you go to the prophet and ask him for help? Ask him for some financial assistance. This woman, she says to her son, 
that the Prophet has a lot of hardships. And I don't want to add another burden on the Prophet. Allahu Akbar. You have women like this, you have women like this, who are true female companions of the Prophet, who are so concerned about the Prophet. And then you have others who, who discourage their spouses, their sons, their brothers, their tribesmen. They discourage them from supporting the Prophet. They encourage evil. They forbid that which is good. They clutch their, their hands shut. The Mufassirin, they say, this means either they refuse to hold a weapon and fight, or they refuse to offer any type of support to the Prophet. Their hands are clinched, meaning that they're not willing to give to the community. They're selfish. They forgot God. And he forgot them. Now, the first part of this phrase is understandable. Someone who forgets God is not conscious of God. They don't think about God. They don't think about the hereafter. They're disconnected from God. It's easy to understand how a human being can forget God. But what does it mean when Allah says he forgot them? The consequence of forgetting God of disconnecting from your Lord is that he will also forget you. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget anything. He knows everything. Allah is not forgetful. So what does it mean when Allah says he will also forget them? When you forget someone, you're not able to help them. You don't help them. You can't help someone that you've forgotten about. In order to help, you have to remember them. So when Allah says that He forgot them, it doesn't mean that He forgot them in the way that we understand. He forgot them meaning that He, he will not support them. He will not guide them. He will leave them to themselves. <inaudible> Indeed, the hypocrites are the, the ones who are corrupt. And you find, and I'll conclude with this hadith from the Holy Prophet, you know, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, the problem of nifaq during the time of the Prophet is an issue that is down, it's downplayed in Sunni hadith literature. Sunni scholars, unfortunately, they, they de-emphasize the problem of hypocrisy during the life of the Prophet. They make it seem as though, you know, it was just a handful of people, but the overwhelming majority of the companions of the Prophet were steadfast. They were righteous. They were obedient to the Prophet. And this is simply not the case. If you look so far in Surah at tawbah verse after verse, Allah condemns, He admonishes, He criticizes, He threatens the munafiqeen. And you find that the issue of nifaq was, was an issue of great concern to the Prophet. There's a hadith, from Amir al Mu'minin, Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he quotes the Prophet. He says, The Prophet says to me, So this is a conversation between Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Prophet tells Imam Ali alayhi salam, The Prophet says to the Imam, I am afraid neither of a believer nor of an unbeliever. And then the Prophet explains. The Prophet says, you know, after my demise, I'm not worried about the mu'mineen and I'm not worried about mushrikeen. Why? As for the believer, Allah will afford him protection because of his belief. The mu'mineen will be protected. Their faith will protect them. وَأَمَّا الْمُشْرِكِ As for the mushrikeen, فَيَقْمَعَهُ اللَّهُ بِشِرْكِ As for the mushrikeen, Allah will humiliate him because of his disbelief. وَلَكِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ كُلَّ مُنَافِقٍ 
كل منافق الجنان عالم اللسان The Prophet says what I am afraid of after me is the one who has hypocrisy in his heart but has an eloquent tongue. يَقُولُ مَا تَعْرِفُونَ وَيَفْعَلُ مَا تُنْكِرُونَ He says, but I am afraid of everyone from among you who is a hypocrite in his heart and eloquent with his tongue. He speaks what you hold to be true, but he does what you dislike. The Prophet ﷺ, he confides in Amir al-Mu'minin, he says, Oh Ali, this is what I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of the believe, I'm not afraid for the believers, and I'm not afraid of the mushrikeen. My greatest worry is the munafiq, because his words are sweet, but his heart is filled with darkness and hypocrisy and if you look at the history of islam who destroyed the ummah was it the mushrikeen was it the kuffar or were or was this ummah divided and destroyed by those who claimed to be the closest to the prophet who had who had sweet tongues but whose hearts were filled with hypocrisy. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us from the disease of nifaq. We ask Him to illuminate our hearts with the light of faith. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Any questions or comments? So uh, this is actually a question about uh, last class that we had. So related to the zakat. Uh, what is the significance of all the zakat eligible items that we had? Because there's a bunch of different items. Uh, what, what do they have in common? What made them important and not other items, other forms of wealth? So if you look at the, the items that, that have to be taxed, you know, you have to understand, number one, that Islam is a religion that caters to the, the living standards of the majority. And if you look at the items that, that the zakat applies to, there are items that, you know, people need to survive, especially when you consider that, you know, the majority of the world was, uh, was not really... Uh, the majority of the world is in need of things that can kind of just take them out of that state uh, of poverty. So there are certain crops that are uh, that the zakat applies to, certain farm animals. So some scholars argue that because most of the world is rural, that the uh, the zakat items are items that will allow them to sustain themselves because they live outside uh, of the cities. You know, that's, that's one opinion. Zakat is also applied to, uh, to gold and silver, the, the, uh, the dinar and the, that were used as currency at the time. And that's why some of the, uh, the ulama, some of the fuqaha, a minority of them, they uh, they would also apply zakat to uh, to, uh, to to money. So what's the wisdom behind uh, those specific items? So again, if you go through the, the items, there are certain crops, and I, I actually have to look them up. I think they're uh, they are uh, so the there are certain cattle, cows, camels, goats, and sheep. And as for the uh, the crops. I believe that there are uh, dates. Um, I, have, I would have to look up the other uh, items, but there are essentially things that people can use 
to uh, to derive uh, foods, and it it would give them uh, a type of uh, self sufficiency. You know, if someone is given a cow or a goat, you know they'll be able to sustain themselves long term. That they'll have a permanent source of uh, of food. But Allah knows best as to why those specific, uh, because they're not applied to anything beyond those specific, uh, those specific items. They're 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 really uh, a tax that's heavily focused on agricultural items. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. Uh, it was really interesting what you were saying today in the class about the leaders and it kind of that they basically. Sounds like the less one of the lessons that leaders should really be open to listening to the people and consulting with them. Yes. Yeah, and, and not only, and, and and even if you are a leader who listens to everyone, you're still going to have people who have animosity towards you. So it's it's an impossible goal to set for yourself to say that I'm going to lead in such a way where I'm going to win the approval of everybody. You know, whether you're the head of a household, whether you're the imam of a masjid, whether you're the head of an organization, if your goal is to appease everyone and gain 100% approval, that's an unachievable goal. Because even the Prophet did not have, you know, if, if, if Muslims were to vote you, you know, anonymously about how they felt about the Prophet, many of them would disapprove of his leadership style based on this, the ayah that we're reading. So... You know, the verse teaches us about the importance of being consultative because that's really the most effective way to, uh, to lead, to make your followers feel like they're stakeholders, that it's not a dictatorial type of relationship. But at the same time, bearing in mind that you are going to have people who oppose you. And there is no leader who is more perfect than the prophet. And even he faced a lot of, you know, criticism. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Thank uh, you very much. Sheikh. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do all of this. And this was a really interesting class. A lot of a lot of history that's being covered here. Alhamdulillah. There's there's and it gets more interesting, inshallah. There are some verses coming up that uh, are really eye opening, inshallah. Inshallah. Looking forward to it. Jazakumullah. Please keep me in your dua, inshallah.